I'm Scott Malcolmson. I'm Director of Communications for International Crisis Group, joined today by Didem Collinsworth and Hugh Pope, both in Istanbul, who are crisis group analysts there. They've just completed a new report on Syrian refugees in Turkey. Didem, could you tell us a bit about the main focus of the report and the current humanitarian situation inside Turkey? Hello, Scott. Um, for now, the greatest challenge remains the Syrian refugees, um, it, particularly with regard to the effects of the Syrian crisis in Turkey. Uh, currently, there are at least 300,000, perhaps 450,000 Syrians in Turkey. About half of these are in 17 camps uh, found on different provinces near the Syrian border. And um, the rest of them are in villages, towns, city centers, again, mostly in the southeast, but, but elsewhere in Turkey as well. Um, so far, Turkish response to the refugees has been very generous, very welcoming. Uh, it has done most of this, it has carried most of this burden by itself, uh, spent around $750 million, according to Turkish figures, on refugees. The cost of refugees uh, monthly for Turkey is uh, between 50 to $60 million. Um, but like I said, um, it has mostly been um, handling this on its own resources. Um, and with the UN saying that the, the number of fleeing Syrians could triple perhaps uh, within this year and that the very likelihood that the Syrian crisis will extend beyond 2013, uh, this uh, picture does not look very sustainable at the moment. Um, and uh, there are also right now already 100,000 Syrians waiting on the Syrian side of the border to cross in. While Turkey says it opens, sorry, it maintains an open door policy, um, in practice it admits that it's only letting in um, limited numbers, those that need assistance and so on, um, and not everyone who wants to come in um, because the camp capacities are full. Uh, therefore, definitely um, looking forward, this is the main area that will need uh, both more international funding and uh, international focus and also uh, a a change of policy and change of emphasis on the Turkish side as well. How, uh, how willing do you think Turkey is to change its policy and what's your assessment of the uh, willingness of aid donors to increase their amounts? Well, Turkey has, when, it, when the conflict first started about two years ago now, or ex exactly two years ago now, um, Turkey was under the impression um, that it was going to be over very quickly. Uh, to a certain extent, I think Turkish officials still maintain the view that the crisis will be over uh, soon. But we have seen, as the, the, the refugee numbers increased, uh, particularly after the summer of 2012, we have also seen somewhat of a change in Turkish approach to international aid. At first, uh, there were the, the, the attitude was we can handle this ourselves. But once the numbers exceeded 100,000, uh, then they realized that, that this could be uh, a long-term problem and that this could be a very costly problem. Uh, therefore, uh, like I said, from late 2012, onwards, we have seen um, sort of international appeals by the Turkish Red Crescent, um, more openness on Turkish official side for accepting international aid, but still Turkish regulations are quite strict. Um, there are several reasons for this. One is that the, the refugees, uh, we call them refugees, obviously the world calls them refugees, but Turkish legal system does not call them refugees um, because of the, the geographic restrictions it has put on the 1951 Geneva Convention uh, that deals with refugees internationally. Uh, another reason is just in general, it's um, a, a, an understandable uh, Turkish desire to control what's happening on its own territory. Um, but for these reasons, it has been reluctant to allow um, international control or monitoring or, or that sort of activity in refugee camps or regarding Syrians that are outside of the camps in Turkey. Um, in practice, I think this is, we will see this and we are seeing this loosen up. Um, but uh, in terms of changing laws and regulations, um, we haven't uh, seen any of that yet. Uh, but um, like I said, I think their approach is becoming a little bit more pragmatic. Hugh, uh, can I just ask you, what are the realities of aid delivery on the ground on the Syrian side? I mean, is it, is it possible to organize it? Is there a central organization? Uh, is, it, is, it, uh, is it being used by smugglers? And what's, what's the situation there? 
it is possible, but it's all pretty much ad hoc. People are making it up as they go along. It's about three million people, we think, on the other side of the border in opposition-held areas, which would obviously require a huge amount of aid if it was to be done properly. Currently, I don't think there's a day that more than 100 trucks go across the border and possibly only 50 some days. So there's a real inadequacy in the supply chain. Also, it's, uh, it's very difficult to know where it's going because many Turkish truckers won't take it all the way to the destination. It has to be stopped at the border um, and changed over to a Syrian truck. And in Syria today, there's a real shortage of fuel. There's a shortage of trucks. Um, in one Turkish aid movement to get 50,000 tons of flour over to bakeries in northern Syria, they were only managed that. To, to put across 10% of the amount they'd hoped to in the first six weeks. So it takes a long time, and for internationals, uh, it's very difficult because there's kidnapping, there's a lot of insecurity. We've seen in February there was a car bomb at one of the borders which killed 14 people. Uh, on Monday there was a Syrian bombing raid on a major artery that comes in from one of the Turkish uh, border points, and today, Wednesday, there was actually a riot by Syrians trying to cross into Turkey, which ended up with burnings, shootings, and seven people wounded. So mm. the, the, the situation is pretty tense in some in some cases, and it, it makes people very wary about the whole cross-border effort. Didem, what has the reaction been within Turkey to the release of your report? Um, there has been media coverage uh, mostly to underline uh, the already existing views of kind of an opposition in Turkey towards government policies and, and somehow that, that they are dragging Turkey into the Syrian quagmire. I think um, the main aspect that has been underlined uh, is our recommendation that, that you know, Turkey should um, be careful and, and um, you know, see this as a, as a long-term problem, but also that it should not make, uh, portray itself as a Sunni Muslim power. Power. It was a point that we made in our report that was underlined several times. Uh, but overall, and, and also the fact that, you know, it has all these Syrians on its soil now. It is housing um, many opposition fighters. And um, I think uh, one of the columnists pointed out one of our um, the subtitles, subsection headings, the enemy of my enemy can be a dangerous friend. Um, and they, they thought that it was very um, telling of the situation uh, of how Turkey is approaching this this very sort of dangerous, uh, unstable situation. It seems like just a, a, a very short time ago that uh, Turkey's foreign minister, uh, Mr. Davutoglu, spoke about a, a zero problems with neighbors policy. Obviously, they have pretty big problem with uh, one neighbor, namely Syria. What's the, what's the reassessment, if there has been one, of that policy within, uh, within Turkey? I think that uh, there's been a considerable retrenchment in Turkey's forward position in the Middle East, which it developed over the last few years. As soon as Syria was seen as threatening with um, chemical weapons, Turkey very quickly uh, rang up its partners in NATO and said, I need Patriot missiles. Because we've got to remember that in Turkey, only about a third of the people here actually support the government's policy of uh, being uh, very interventionist in Syria and less than 10% of the population agree with the, the Turkish government's strong support of the armed opposition in, in Syria. And I think that given the Turkish Prime Minister's recent visits to Europe, given the fact that Turkey's Middle Eastern uh, policy actually lies more or less in ruins because both the, the, the disturbances in Iraq and Syria have basically cut off most of Turkey's trade routes to the Middle East. Mm. And now Turkey is not just a, a, a partisan actor in the Sunni Muslim world, supporting a Sunni Muslim cause, but it is also supporting one faction within the Sunni Arab world, being very close to Qatar, but not so close to Saudi Arabia. And we're also seeing a fairly consistent uh, drumbeat of uh, uh, of critical commentary about Turkey in the in the Arab press. All this, I think, is going to end up with Turkey profiling it a bit more with its Western and European allies than it did in the past. Could you just say a few words about the relationship between Turkey's approach to the Syrian conflict 
and it's evolving uh, policies towards the PKK and uh, towards Kurdish issues? Turkey has launched, uh, since January, a, a, a really quite op, um, encouraging effort to end 30 years of uh, Kurdish insurgency in Turkey, the PKK insurgency, and also to solve the Kurdish problem. I think the main reason is that the imprisoned, jailed PKK leader seems to have won the trust of the Turkish authorities as the person who can bring his men down from the mountains. But also, it is very important for Turkey to, to sort the domestic Kurdish problem out because in Syria, northern Syria, one of the most effective single militias is the sister party of the PKK in Turkey. Mm. And if Turkey can solve its PKK problem, I think it sees that it can have a much more realistic policy along its border in northern Syria. And if it has a, a, a Kurdish population that is comfortable with the Republic of Turkey, which has not been the case for 100 years or so, if it can really change that, then its relationship with the Iraqi Kurdistan region, which is also next door, will also improve. And so Turkey, I think, sees that given the tumult in the Middle East, let me um, leave that for later. I'll take the bird in the hand that I have now, northern Iraq, and also potentially uh, what's left of Syria that is uh, friendly to me, and then um, that way at least my borders will be secure. So quite a risky gamble, but that, I think that's the, the underlying uh, tenor of Turkish policy. And Didem, can you just say, the like looking out, say one to two months ahead from now, uh, the the situation for the humanitarian situation very likely to worsen, according to the the UN uh, studies that you referred to at the beginning. Given that, what are the major policy changes that 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 you found uh, and that the report advocates? that could uh, at least ameliorate or really improve the situation uh, in, in the next one to two months? Um, and the Syria war obviously won't go on indefinitely, but as you rightly pointed out, the humanitarian situation will likely get a lot worse before it gets any better. <clears throat> the main problem is right now the, the Syrians in northern Syria and um, the currently, uh, like we said before, there is some sort of aid that's going through Turkey to northern Syria, but um, the, the two different uh, policy areas where uh, we emphasize are uh, one, Turkey should maintain its borders open for all the Syrians that should that, that want to come in that are fleeing the conflict in Syria, uh, but it can't do this alone. And it needs, it will need international assistance, international funds, and internationally run camps. But in order to do this, it will need to to streamline its regulations, change its regulations to allow for this to happen, to have international or UN camps. Um, so that's one side of it. The second side of it is um, obviously getting the aid to the people inside Syria, which is the preferable solution. Um, currently, there's, like we said, zero point assistance, um, cross border. Uh, sort of, it's not really called cross-border aid, but basically sending aid uh, from the Turkish border into northern Syria, but it has been grossly insufficient. It does not meet the demands of the Syrians. Uh, to In order to increase this amount, um, you know, there's a need for a UN Security Council or UN action to um, allow for uh, humanitarian assistance to cross into Syria. There is a need for the Syrian regime to allow uh, such aid to go to opposition controlled areas. There is a need for the Syrian opposition to ensure that this aid um, can be transferred without, uh, in a safe corridor, um, without you know aid workers being kidnapped or attacked, which happens. Um, so there, there, and also for the EU as well. Uh, EU, we feel like, should take more of the burden by uh, accepting refugees, uh, by also providing assistance to Turkey, who is shouldering uh, a large part of the burden. So there, there are policy uh, changes and policy recommendations for all the parties involved, um, but mainly um, for Turkey, I would say it would be maintain your border open, but do it with international assistance. Um, you know, streamline your regulations where necessary to allow that to happen. Uh, facilitate registration of international NGOs that are delivering aid to northern Syria because right now that is the only solution that helps those stuck on the other side of the border. And um, yeah, for, for now, that seems to be the, the most logical path to follow. Didem Collinsworth and Hugh Pope in Istanbul, thank you very much.